Welcome back to another episode of the Freedom Sisters podcast. Today, Laura Jones, a 23-year Air Force veteran, graces your ears today. She has a story that is really remarkable, um, like all women who served. And when you listen to her and you hear her journey and you see the career field that she excelled in and she was is still very passionate about and has hopes and dreams to work in the civilian sector um, doing that same job just goes to show that it doesn't matter where what you look like, where you come from. If you've got it in you to serve and you've got it in you to do something that you're passionate about, ladies, get after it. Go do it. So I hope you leave this conversation feeling empowered to walk in the path that you were created for. So listen in. Here we are with Laura Jones, live in living color today on the Freedom Sisters podcast. I am excited to have you here. Hi. Good hey. to you. Hey. <laughs> Laura, I'm excited for our listeners to get to know you because you're a sister vet, but you are also one of the eight women who are going to be featured at this year's Shiro Talk. Yes, I'm excited about that and I'm kind of, uh, yeah, ready to get started. <laughs> yeah, me too, me too. So I wonder if we could just get things going and begin with your story, with who you are, what you do, and talk about your family of origin. Sure. So I am Laura Jones, and I am originally from Portland, Oregon. I joined the military when I was 19, I think. What kind of in, inspired me to join was my parents got divorced when I was about 13. So I had to go between parents and it was just a lot of chaos. And I think I was kind of tired of it. And just when I got to the point where I was able to move out, I was like, what can I do now? <laughs> and so I was seeing someone at the time and then his friend had, he was a Marine, just came back from the first Gulf War. And uh, he was telling me about the military and I was like kind of interested. And then I rented a movie for whatever reason. Um, I just fell in love with it. Seeing her, the character transform throughout her time in the military, just from being a spoiled brat and not knowing anything about the military and getting out of the military as a, you know, confident woman and I was like that's what I want to do. <laughs> I didn't want to join the army necessarily so I went and talked to the Air Force recruiter and I wanted to do something uh, mechanical. Before I joined I was in the automotive skills college degree program the recruiter and he gave me a job description for aerospace ground equipment and I read that and it was like oh my gosh sign me up. <laughs> It was like surprised my parents they ever expected this because I was always really quiet in school and um, played I was in the orchestra and I was just a little nerd didn't really have any <laughs> life goals at that time but I was really inspired by auto mechanics my high school senior year so that's what I joined I wanted to study in college college got to be too crazy and I was very irresponsible with my college loans so I decided I need to do something with my life and I said joining the Air Force is what I want to do so that's the beginning of it. <laughs> awesome. What instrument did you play? Oh I played the violin and the viola. Oh nice. I love it when cool. people come on um, and there's a cool thread besides being sisters in service but mm -hmm. I'm also from the northwest and from Boise. Orchestra is really big in the northwest band and football is really big in the south and uh, I played viola. I started playing the cello and then I switched to viola because I had to walk to and from school so it's much yeah, easier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what drew you towards mechanics? My senior year in high school I had to take one more elective to graduate and the only thing I hadn't taken was auto mechanics. Okay, I'll try it. But I was really scared and nervous about getting dirty. Which is why <laughs> you picked the Air Force and not right. the Army. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I went the first day of class I brought rubber gloves, like dish gloves to the class and the instructor looked at me like, What are you doing? <laughs> I said, I just don't want to get dirty. And he was just so welcoming and just kind of laughed, but was like, okay, I understand, but you're not, you're not going to get that dirty. And so he was really, he opened up to me like it wasn't anything to have a girl in the class. So I felt comfortable learning it in the classroom. It always 
comes down to having a great instructor. He really inspired me to continue because once I saw an engine that was cut out so you could see the pistons and all the movement and everything, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. I just fell in love with it. And he inspired me to continue, you know, studying it in college. I guess my inspiration was also to not be taken advantage of if I, you know, as a woman needing car maintenance and going to the mechanic and having the mechanic say, oh, you need this, this, and this. And it's like, no, all you really need is one little thing. And, and they just trying to, you know, take advantage right. of you. So if I can learn how to do it myself, I'll be able to be more independent and felt like that was where I wanted to be. Awesome. When you went into the Air Force, you know, you went to St. San Antonio, Texas for yes. training. So can you just take us a little bit on that journey? Like when you went in, how long you served, all the places you served, and then what aircraft did you work on? Things like that. Okay. So basic training was an experience. I didn't know what I was getting into, but I was very excited. A couple of girls from MEPS, we were all kind of in the we, you flights all together. And then once you get there, it's like, whoa, what's going on? <laughs> I think one of my funniest memories of basic is that, or a couple of memories is that I was so nervous and I was so scared that I remember waking up from sleeping in the, uh, <laughs> in the position of attention. <laughs> I was actually still, yeah, sleeping and laying down in the position of attention. And I woke up and I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> sleeping at attention. <laughs> it was so funny. And then another one is that, you know, you meet so many girls in basic and from all over the place. And I think one thing that I appreciate about my parents taught me early on to be independent. So I was able to, you know, I learned, they made me do my own laundry, fold my own clothes, all that kind of stuff. And so when I got to um, basic and I met these girls that had never been on their own ever, never had to do their own laundry and all this, and I was just like, whoa, they're really going to struggle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's funny. You mentioned laundry. We didn't do our own laundry at basic training. We weren't allowed to. They made oh, us really? bag it and you had to bag it in such a way though and tie the string around it exactly the way they wanted you to and oh, right, right. you carried it over in the morning and then you go back later in the week I think it was like a two-day turnaround oh, so you yeah. had to make sure you had enough clean to last you because yeah, yeah. then you would be the dirty girl I joined later so I already had three kids when I joined oh, so wow. I was already responsible for three yeah, other yeah. bodies yeah. and then to like get there and PT for some of these high school girls like mm. couldn't even do 20 right. sit-ups. I'm like, yeah. you were coming into the army. You knew you needed to prepare for this. <laughs> what is going on? It's so oh, funny yeah. the things you remember about basic. Yep. <laughs> Crazy. I would do it all over again though. Like it was so oh, yeah. much fun. It was like so fun. intense, but I love intensity and fun. Like I had a good time. You yeah. Like so keep going. Tell us more about oh. your time in the service. <laughs> yeah. So another thing that I, you know, about basic was that you just see how inspired you are by helping other people, you, you get that sense of teamwork, especially for like PT, like you said, you see people that are struggling and it's like, you want to help encourage them to get through it. So you're all kind of on that team. And that was, that was kind of cool. And then after basic, you know, you go to tech school, my tech school was in Wichita Falls, uh, Texas. So tech school was interesting. I, uh, the, the mechanics and the, the engines that we studied were mostly diesel engines and generators. So I really had a lot of fun with it. There was an air conditioning unit and hydraulic test stands and just a whole bunch of equipment. And a tech school is one of the longest ones, but um, there was so much to cover. And from tech school, I got assigned to Ramstein, Germany. We had uh, C-130s, KC-10s, the refuelers. And so the equipment that we learned is universal for either aircraft cargo or uh, fighter jet. But at Ramstein, we only had a few fighter jets, and I think they were on a, a different side of the base. So I didn't have the equi the experience working with those type of aircraft, but because the, the equipment is a little bit more specified for those. I think working for heavies was a little bit less uh, stressful because it wasn't so high high paced compared to working with fighters. Once <laughs> you kind of get used to that 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 level of stress, and then my first kind of moving ahead. My first experience with uh, working with fighter jets was when I was eight years into the Air Force and 
uh, moving into a fighter base, I was like, whoa, this is so different. <laughs> it was really crazy. So you served 20, is it 24 or 26 years? Oh, no, 23. 23. 23. Well, I'm just giving you extra time. Yeah. <laughs> Anything over 20 I know, goes right? my mind. So yeah. out of 23 years, how many times did you move? Eight assignments. You got married while you were in the service. Was your husband also in the Air Force, or did you meet him as a civilian? No, he was actually also Air Force uh, in the same career field. When I went to Little Rock, that's where I met my husband. I'm trying to remember now. <laughs> <laughs> Once I got to Little Rock, he was E3, so he was, oh no, I was E5 and he was E4. Okay, that's what. And so I was assigned to his group section. And since I outranked him, I was put in charge of, of a team of people. That as the E5, I had to be a manager. This was my first experience managing. And he was really knowledgeable and I kind of gravitated towards him because he knew so much about the equipment. And I was like, I want to learn, I want to learn as much as I can from him. So we kind of started um, hanging out a lot more. <laughs> he deployed a few months after we had met and we were talking back and forth through email and stuff. We were having a long distance relationship <laughs> that, yeah. at that point. Yeah. And on the down low from everybody else, nobody, would, our, our supervisors didn't know. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Funny story is that he wrote me a really sweet email and I printed it out because I was like, oh, this is so sweet. It didn't print at the printer at the desk that I was at. And I was oh, like, no. oh, no. I said, maybe the printer is not working or out of paper. Sure enough, no. The next week, Monday, <laughs> my, my flight chief comes over. He's like, is this yours? <laughs> it printed in the flight chief's office. And so and then the cat was out of the bag. Everybody knew. <laughs> I was so embarrassed and oh, man. oh my gosh. I mean, it was cool. We were both single after they knew about our relationship. They said, once he gets back from the deployment, you guys have to work separately. But oh, it was so embarrassing. But That's they were awesome. all, they were all happy for us. You know, they could, liked both of us. That's awesome. And how many years married have you guys been now? Oh, 17 this year. Well done. Well done. <laughs> What's the secret of being a dual military and being successful oh, yeah. and having babies and all the things? Any, any advice that you could give other dual status military members who are in it for the long haul that marriage is a priority? That is the um, million dollar question. <clears throat> <laughs> it is so tough. I think what worked for us, we worked together. So we knew what the stress level was what we both dealt with at work. We had the understanding. We just kind of teamed up and we said, you know, if you have to go in this 12 hour shift or on the weekends or whatever, I got the kids, no big deal. And so that was the mutual understanding that we would be there. One of us would be there. We just took turns like that, you know. Yeah. And what about motherhood in the military for you? How soon did you have to go back to work? We've seen changes happen later. I mean, much later even. After I got out, there was new changes in the maternity time being back to work when you took PT tests and all of that. So how did you navigate motherhood? So motherhood, I think I got like six weeks off after having the baby. And then my husband didn't get any paternity leave at that time. So he had took an extra two weeks. I think we had taking PT tests six months after the baby. So now I think it's a year long or something like that. So you have a little bit more recovery time. And I think that's necessary. It was a lot of stress. I gained, I think, 70 pounds. <laughs> so <laughs> having to lose that, was it was tough. But um, I stayed active usually mostly during my pre pregnancy too. So that was helpful. It was pretty, they have it nicer now. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> what was a mom hack that maybe you discovered along the way that just made your life easier as far as planning out your next day or your week that might be helpful for moms. I know you were married and there's a lot of dual status moms in the military. So is there something that just worked for you that was really helpful? Hmm. I had some troops that were single parents or having to supervise them and dealing with their uh, struggles as a single parent. It opened my eyes to a lot of struggles that I did, hadn't dealt with. Understanding that your kids are your priority and make sure that you have a backup plan, even if it's not your spouse, but someone that you trust and having someone because your schedule is so unpredictable in the military. If you're stressing out about your kid, that's going to add more stress. I know the hard part is, you know, going to a new base and you don't know anybody, even if it's your supervisor or your first sergeant, because you, 
you have to, <laughs> they have to help you with that kind of stuff. So I think um, until you can find someone that you trust. Yeah. I think yeah. That's a, big thing. Um, a good place to start, especially when you move is family readiness, not necessarily FRG, but the Family Readiness Support Center that's yeah. on post uh, or base. That's usually a really good start. Uh, yeah. So, well, thank you so much for sharing that. What was your favorite station? Oh, Okinawa for sure. For, so let's talk. I saw that you went to Minot. Yeah. <laughs> you, got, you were there for some time. How is it being stationed there? And I just hear horror stories about that place because it's so isolated and really poverty. So and I may be wrong about that, but that's just my understanding. I've never been there, so I cannot speak by a first-person experience. So how was it being stationed there, and what did you like best about there, and what was the worst part? Of it? Okay, so I do have a best and worst. It was traumatic. Getting orders from Okinawa, Tropical Island, Okinawa, to Minot in the middle of freaking nowhere <laughs> was like what is going on? And so I was so angry and just pissed off even before I got there. And it took a while to get authorized to be, to work around nukes. And so I had to email back and forth with Mina and the commander had to sign something and he was taking forever and ever. We couldn't get our orders until he signed. And I kept hounding the, the manager the security manager about this and it got to the commander <laughs> he 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 knew that i was hounding him about this and so when we in process and meet the commander he's like oh so you're sergeant jones i know you <laughs> i know you already <laughs> you started you started causing problems already and i was like oh well you took forever to sign this paperwork <laughs> what do you expect so that just set the tone might not has its own pace they're not going to rush for anybody and uh, yeah, the leadership, I don't know, we had heard horror stories before that, and that we got there after the, the, the situation where they flew live nukes over from Minot to Barksdale. And so after that, the whole base was going through inspections. We expected the leadership changed out by now and they have their stuff together, right? And sure enough, we get to base and we're just like, what is going on? This is so different. The whole um, shop was set up so differently. They had the, they were just starting the new process of how to uh, process equipment differently. And so they were kind of like the, the pilot uh, program for that. And it was so Which different. Makes the most sense, right? You just yeah. <laughs> fly nukes. Let's make you the pilot. Exactly. Let's make you the so, standard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, because they thought that we're going to revamp everything. What was the best part about it? The best part was... <sighs> The people in the community. Well, first of all, the sunsets and sunrises are gorgeous. Those were really nice to see every morning. We did get to see the northern lights a couple of times, so that was kind of cool. And then I got my kids to start taking violin and cello lessons because the Minot Symphony was really um, popular and cheap entertainment. I love that. Yeah, that's the best part. <laughs> yeah, so... We talk about we talk about faith over here at Freedom Sisters podcast. And in all of this adventure in your life, at what point in your journey did you become a believer or believe and know that there's somebody who's bigger than you? Where did that happen for you? I think I've always kind of believed or known, felt that there's a higher power. And I I feel the hardest part for me was in my not uh, career wise as well too. I was having some run-ins with my supervisor, which all went all the way up to the commander, and it was just really tra traumatizing. So I I kept telling myself, "This is you're going through this to put you in a better place later on." And so my mantra was, "This won't last forever. Just keep going." Even though it didn't work out the way I wanted to, it, I didn't get to be the flight chief that I had dreamed of. My career was headed in a new direction that wasn't going to take me to where I wanted to go, but at least I knew I could retire. <laughs> that was a big thing and set my family up for success that way. Just know, even though going through tough times, knowing that it's not going to last forever, that, that's the, that's what I, what's, what keeps me going, how I got through it. Awesome. So I first met you officially when we both spoke at the hearing committee here in Washington state yeah. for the women veterans license plate. Yeah. And for someone who would oppose that idea, what would you say to them? I, that, that event 
that experience was so incredibly compelling for me, even as a supporter of it. But what would you say to somebody who opposes the idea of having women veteran as a license plate? What would you say to that? That's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> so how, why are you for it? What is, maybe we should shape it that way. What, what about that compels you to speak up and say, hey, yes, this is a need because. Okay, yeah, maybe that's, I think uh, because women veterans, um, it's still so assumed that we don't, we don't serve, you know, we look, we don't look like someone who serves. When you look at somebody, you could tell the guys usually from their buzz cuts or whatever. And it's like, you, you can kind of tell, but for women, we just kind of blend in and, and it doesn't, nothing really stands out unless we're in uniform or unless we have something that shows that we are a veteran. So I think when there's awareness, when there's more awareness out there, that we do serve and there are women out here that have served. I think that just will help. Um, Absolutely. I was really surprised how fast it went through the committee and how fast it went through the house that it did not go through the Senate is really discouraging. There was a lot of voices at that hearing committee for the house, but when it went up to the Senate, the information wasn't pushed as quickly or as timely for all of us to regroup to go back to the Senate. I don't think any of us thought it was going to take a secondary hearing to really explain why this is a necessity. Right. You should be able to showcase your service however you want, whether you put your DD-214 on the back of your pickup truck because you want everyone to know all the medals you ever received, right. or just a simple woman veteran license plate. And so here in Washington State, they were going to use that money that they were going to be getting from that plate to pour back into the women veteran nonprofit sector right. that is huge like we need oh, yeah. that because we are already at a disadvantage for so many reasons so I'm hopeful it will go up again and I'm hopeful that the communication will be better for all of us to yeah, reunite sure. they do, me they too do again. and now yeah. I want one I want one because they told me no we're gonna win we're gonna yeah. win um, <laughs> Um, to that end, when leaving service, women are often faced with a slew of challenges as we try to assimilate back into civilian life. What was the hardest challenge you faced personally, and how did you overcome that? Mm. I still feel like I'm transitioning. I told myself, you have all these benefits, you need to use them. So I told myself, I finished my degree, which I did. I'm graduating this, this month. <laughs> and um, so I finished Congratulations. That. Yeah, thank you. And so my next step is putting my experience and my education to where I want to go, what I, what I want to do next. And right now, I have a vision and a goal to work for Alaska one day, <laughs> but getting there is still part of the process. So I'm, I'm working on getting some experience in some leadership roles, some training. My degree is in uh, technical education, so I wanted to try to hopefully get some experience uh, in the civilian sector for that anyway. But it's overwhelming though, because there's so much, you have so many opportunities now, you have so many options and nothing is um, set out for you anymore. You have to figure it out yourself. <laughs> and that's what I think is the hard part. While you're in the service, I can't wait to get out so I can do my own thing. But once you get out and have all these options, it's like, oh, what do I, what do I pick now? You know, that's a really good point because the milestones and all the things you need to do to level up mm -hmm. are mapped out. There is a blueprint. What energies you put into that definitely sets you apart in, you right. know, the ranking system, but there definitely is a blueprint. You're right. There's way too many options. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and how long have you been out? About a year and a half. Okay. So you're, yeah, that's pretty fresh. So you're doing, you're hitting milestones. You're hitting achievements and goals getting your degree is this a bachelor's degree or a master's yeah, program bachelor's. bachelor's yeah beautiful awesome job you have such a really strong voice laura with the things that i've seen you do the zoom webinars that you've been doing um, on facebook and things like that i you have a really strong voice for the community so i have no doubt that you'll be able to obtain <laughs> um, wherever you're wanting to go with this next chapter you're volunteering your time at Redefining You Foundation. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like, I know why I love Shelly and Redefining You. Can you tell me <laughs> why you love that organization and what they're doing that's different? Because it is a transition service from combat uniform to the business sector. But what are they doing that's different that captivated you? 
I think for me, it was just focusing on women's um, experiences uh, through, through transition and through the military service, because before I had got out, I went through the transition assistance program and it was all, you know, very technical, very informational. And when I learned about the redefining your future, I thought, oh, this is be, this is awesome because it was specific for women and spouses and being able to share or hear people's stories on how their transition has been for them. The emotional part of it is something that's not talked about uh, in any of the transition programs. So uh, Redefining Your Future really focuses on that and how to, mm, I guess, you know, keep yourself healthy and, you know, taking care of yourself mentally and emotionally. I think that's uh, such a big part of it. That's not part of the standard. I, I, once I met Shelly and she has all that energy, I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> yes, she does. This, this is awesome. I said, this is what we need. You know, we need someone to encourage us. That transition of leaving the service is so scary for so many people because you just don't know what to do. You don't know what where you, you're going to, or how it's going to feel, how it's going to affect your family. You get so comfortable with, you know, the paycheck twice a month. <laughs> so now you have to figure out what you're going to do next to maintain that level of, you know, security for your family. So it's, and it's hard when you don't really know. Sometimes when people transition at the, not prepared or it's not, um, not planned. So they might get out on a medical or something happens for where they can't stay in the military. So and if you don't have that preparation or that mental focus, mental uh, or the, the emotional support, it's hard. It's really scary for so many people, not just women, but for the whole family as well, too. What is the single biggest thing you miss about being in the service? I think just the traveling. I do miss being able to go to different places. I loved moving from different bases, experiencing different cultures. That was my favorite part. Then the people and the friends that you make. In the military, you make your own family because you have so many friends all over the place that you choose to keep in your in your life. That's something that's different from the civilian side is that camaraderie, that brotherhood, that sisterhood with other people. I don't know if you know anything about the Enneagram. I drop hints on here all the time for people to like start picking up that conversation, but I'm an Enneagram eight wing seven. So I'm a justice fighter and a leader, a challenger. And I'm also an enthusiast. I'm spontaneous. I want to have fun and all the things. So the adventure and the op tempo of the military was my jam. And I am super assertive in my presentation to people. I've had to learn to soften those edges a little bit, not all the way, because I, I have to be true to who I am. But I find a military appreciates the very strong masculine traits that I have, and the civilian side doesn't. I really felt like an identity crisis. Like I, I jumped into the army really not knowing what to expect. So to have a career that really meshed with my personality and then to get out, um, mm -hmm. and have to rediscover who I am and understand that civilians yeah. are a whole lot slower. Like <laughs> I'm in the process changes, procedural changes. That's really hard to get accustomed to. Maybe you'll not see that in aviation. Alaska Airlines and Boeing are really forward thinking and trying to be innovative in those fields. And so hopefully it's a bit quicker and right. ma maintains that level, you know, bot tempo. I, I kind of expect to. My mom has told me about her working in the civilian world. It's, not, it's, it's no different. You're still going to have the stress from people not doing their jobs. My husband worked with a real estate uh, company, and he said that one of the hardest things for him was to not be involved in the in the board meetings because at his rank, he was always board meetings with the commander, had all the information. As a civilian, you're back into at the lowest level, and you're not involved with all the decision-making is what you're used to. <laughs> That's very true. And you know, a lot of people think I served 20 plus years. I was in management for 15 of that, right? Because really anytime you become an E4, you have a team and then you so on and so forth. You are managing people from all the way up to being first sergeant, which you also were. But we have to think just because we hold that esteem in the military and this is something your husband learned. But guess what? The civilian people have been doing that and, and obtaining their goals too. So you're competing with people who also have been doing careers, just not your career. And so a lot of people have that mindset. I'm getting out, I'm getting a six 
figure job salary a year. So be prepared for that. And a lot of us aren't prepared for that. I was the receptionist. That's how I got my foot in the store. And I've got a lot of skills in a degree. I actually sat at a battalion command level as a captain. That was the worst 18 months of my life. But I was coming in just to get in, to start again. And so I think that's a really helpful mindset when you're getting out and you're trying new things to know that even if you don't get this boom, top job, get your foot in the door because once your foot's in the door and they see your work ethic and they see how hard of a worker you are, all the skills that you do bring from the military do translate, even though on your resume, it didn't look that way, but they really do. You're going to achieve and you're going to go faster than those peers who, who don't have that skill set. So don't be afraid to start over. Yeah. That's one thing that I have to tell myself is that once I get into something, it's I'm starting at the bottom level, just like, you know, because nobody knows me, nobody knows um, what my skills are and my experience. So I have to prove that again. You know, I can't just come in there and take over. Give yourself six months and, yeah. and they'll, they'll see it for yeah. sure. For your degree for technical instruction, you already have some experience teaching. And one organization, the Lean In Together Circle, you were a founder and a moderator for that. Can you tell us what that is and how you got involved and why Lean In matters? So Lean In, actually, I read the book in 2016 when I was going through that incident with my supervisor. So it really kind of grounded me and made me realize that this is not just me. It's an experience that women have is ha having to prove yourself or not being uh believed when you say something or when you speak up and so that really inspired me to share my story and work to help other women get their voices heard and feel part of the community feel like their experience does matter and their voice uh, does matter so when I got here I started a joint I started a circle on joint base Lewis McCord and then I met Elise um, Salamone so she's also a retired Lieutenant Colonel Air Force. And uh, so we teamed up to start the Tacoma uh, Circle. And so we're still kind of um, building that. And it's not as big as the Seattle, but we're kind of under their umbrella. But um, it's building that community and connecting women to other women that are motivating and inspiring to help mentor each other and keep each other going uh, throughout whatever challenges that we're facing. So. So how does somebody get involved, whether it's the Tacoma Circle or other circles? How do they find out about Lean In Circles? And is there requirements? What is, how do you guys meet too in the pandemic? Like, what are you guys doing now? We haven't been meeting. Uh, so we're hoping, you know, to start doing some more face-to-face. Um, -face. Uh, but there are ways to connect with other circles and going to leanin.org. Lean and you can actually start your own circle in your own areas. Um, it can be face-to-face -face or it can be online. Uh, it doesn't have to be a specific uh, topic or anything or in, any kind of experience, but just women that have um, an interest in supporting each other through whatever. That's awesome. I have a question, and it kind of goes along, but it's a little different. When was the first time you became aware of your gender and the differences in the military environment or post-service environment where there are things that are uniquely hard for us not hard like we can't do it but hard to obtain because like you said people don't believe you and when did you become aware of that I guess throughout my whole career pretty much I didn't have anyone that really doubted me until I got to a certain rank uh, e7 once I put that rank on I saw the com the competition and the doubt I felt like I had so much experience I knew what I was talking about and I felt like now I have the rank to sit at the table and be heard. I noticed that there was a lot of pushback. It was just unwelcoming. I did share my opinion. There was a lot of people that didn't want to hear it. <laughs> and it wasn't just men. So there was a couple of women that I had worked for that were just high and mighty and they didn't want to hear anything from anybody. And so that was really eye-opening for me. And that was hard. That was difficult. Here's kind of a fun question. What was the first thing you did for yourself when you got out of service? I pierced my nose and then I wanted to get my... I wanted to dye my hair blue, but then they said, oh, you have to take out all the color. You have to strip your color. And she said, it's going to ruin your hair. So I said, okay, never mind. <laughs> I'll just do the nose piercing. <laughs> yeah, now I like to paint my nails um, a lot. Nail color that you could actually see. <laughs> yeah, I didn't ever not feel like a woman. I mean, I painted my toenails when I was deployed. 
because I always wanted to have that tangible connection that I'm still carrying under all of this. Like at the end of the day, I'm still a woman and I'm still very proud of that. But it's funny. It's funny. The little things I know I I think grow their beards. The ladies tend to dye their hair as probably the first thing they do. Well, is there anything we have not addressed that you are like, I have an active listening audience that I want to say this to these women. So if you have something to say, please feel free to share that now. Okay. I think the thing that I was wanting to say, just being confident in your dreams, as far as, you know, even if it's something that you don't know, always be open for opportunities because you can learn from so many opportunities and just having experience in different things will help you make a decision if you're undecided. Just being open to different opportunities is a good way to do it. That is great. All right. So we will close this out with my three final questions. Do you have a Bible verse or a Bible story that is your favorite? Not not necessarily a Bible verse. Um, I'm sorry. But I think my favorite quote, we rise by lifting others. And that was by Roger Ingersoll. And I think that's very appropriate because one's out here getting to where they are completely on their own. So everyone has help. Everyone has someone looking out for them and and helping them in whatever situation that they're in. So that inspires me to give back and and from uh, the benefits that I've gotten and the blessings that I've had and to help. I like that. That's a good inspirational quote. Thank you for sharing. (laughs) What about a book recommendation? Something you read along the way, you lean, you said lean in. Is that your book or do you have another one? That one is definitely a, a good one. I had just recently also read a book, The Atomic Habits. It's about making small decisions and small habits that you can do every day differently. It's by James Clear. And it's, a, yeah, just making small changes in your daily routine and to put yourself in a better position. He has such a cool name for marketing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the clear way to make oh, right. that's fun. All right. Those are great book recommendations. And then my last and final question is what advice would you give a young lady who wants to join the military today? Ooh, I've talked to my daughter about this. <laughs> She's uh, 15 years old and she did do ROTC in high school just this past year. So I think ROTC is a good way to kind of get the experience of being in a military environment. It's nothing close to basic training or um, tech school or anything like that, but it does kind of give you a taste. And also be open to the different career opportunities. If you have an interest in something, there's usually a direction that you can go in the military. And I think having military experience, even if it's just for one enlistment, is so transforming. It, for one, you're independent, but you're also part of a team and you're guided by p- professionals as well. I think it's a good experience because you don't get that on the on the outside. You're left to do things on your own, but I think with the military, it's structured and you gain experience in, in those opportunities. Even just one enlistment is a good, a good uh, experience for anybody. <laughs> Well, we didn't even talk about Shiro Talk, but our our listeners know that this is an event that's coming up. If you want to know about Laura, Laura has a remarkable title of her talk, Challenging the Status Quo. If you did not hear that theme in her whole interview and story today, you can go back to the beginning, <laughs> listen again, because she definitely has challenged the status quo with who she is and what she did in service and what she's planning to do post-service. So Laura, I'm really excited to share more of your story and to share that, that impactful message that you have. It's a production of Freedom Sisters. So I'm really, really honored that you are going to come to the table for that event too, and show up big for women all over the place. So thank you for that. And thank you so much for giving me some of your time today. It's always a joy to talk to some like-minded women and and just sharing your guys' stories so the world knows who we are because we are here. We are among (laughs) you, um, and we love our country. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. This was awesome. Appreciate it. (laughs) 
sisters, I know you loved Laura. And if you want to know more, I implore you to come to the website, www.shirotalk.com and learn about all eight women featured speakers who are going to be a part of our inaugural event, July 23rd, 2020 at three to 5 PM is our event. And I don't know what you're waiting for, honestly, because it's not only just a great investment in yourself, but it's also a way to impact our communities. $25 of each ticket sell will go back to providing safe and suitable housing for a homeless female veteran and her child. So come make a difference, invest in yourself, and join us on this very special event.